Yeah, I'm Joseph Ferreira. I'm known as Joseph Red Ferreira. So I'm hardly known as Joseph, so maybe I'm known as Red Ferreira. Through my background in playing sport, um, I played football, and um, the name kept in me once I got into sport. I became a commentator, and um, everybody knows me throughout the Caribbean, throughout the world, as, as Red Ferreira. All right, thank you, Mr. Pereira. Uh, well, today's interview is basically going to be conducted by the president of the Ghana, newly Ghana Basketball Coaching Association. Uh, today is the 24th of April, 2015. Our first question, Mr. Pereira. How long have you been in basketball and in what capacity? Well, as a very young man, I started watching basketball when it was not an official sport. Basketball started after a movie came to Guyana called um, The Go Man Go, and uh, it attracted a lot of boys from Queen's College, uh, Ken Corsby, the Tates, etc. They can go down the line. Um, and they weren't interested in cricket, football, they wanted to play basketball. They had no idea, no coaching, no rules. But um, they uh, began trying to somehow or the other make the way forward. Um, they put up a backboard in the yard of Dr. Tate, which is now where, of course, um, uh, the hotel is, Cara, the Cara Hotel in Farmer Street. That yard carried a backboard on a sapodilla tree, and they learned by watching little movies, and they learned by reading. Um, then there was a court um, up on the seawall, close to the St. Sanchez ground. It was a grass court. They got perm permission to use the police compound to play basketball on a hard court for a while and when they entertain teams from Trinidad and Suriname they use Queen's College. Queen's College um, had enough um, space in the auditorium to play basketball and the Chinese fair at Cosmos Grand Ven also included a basketball tournament and a lot of Suriname teams came from um, Suriname, um, CLD, Independente, uh, a number of teams and they gave the opportunity for, for Ghana to play at, at a fairly high level. So I was uh, around at the inception as a boy, um, I think the, the first tour was made to Suriname I'm not too sure who was the first president. Um, it might be Claude Berry, it might have been J.G. Evans. And eventually, um, the Burnham Court was built um, by uh, um, an engineer who worked um, with the government, um, uh, Henry Cameron. Henry Cameron built the Burnham Court. And I suppose basketball was then born. Okay, okay. And uh, uh, any specific capacity for which you would have served in under that tenure? Um. No, I, I um, was very young. I, I followed, I watched, I, I went to see the games, okay. got to know the people. Uh, there was uh, a church that um, had a, a person by the name of Vosla, and um, he was good and he attracted a group of players and uh, he started a team uh, and you then had the Ravens, you had the Panthers of the East Coast, you had the Vikings and uh, Bosler I think um, started his own team and that enhanced a first division a first division club of some sort. I later um, got attracted to, to being a referee and later I got involved in the interesting of, of coaching. Okay, okay. Um, you serve in any administrative capacity uh, under 
any of the uh, federation or the uh, sub-association? Well, I was uh, a keen member. I was involved with the Panthers Basketball Club. Okay. And um, I actually went to Suriname and spent a year under the national coach um, in Paramaribo. Came back and um, I then became president in 1969. I think there was Harry Diet was the president before me, and I took over in '69. And uh, this is the federation. For president, well, there was no federation, and it was a basketball, Guyana Basketball Association. Okay. Affiliated to the world body. Okay. And I got Chase Manhattan, the bank, to pay the affiliation to FIBA, and got various companies to sponsor um, different things. Uh, we didn't have much of a uh, inheritance. We inherited no sponsorship, no trophies. We inherited no clubs, and uh, we had to, in fact, take the bite the bullet to change teams, which were just a captain and a, and a vice captain, into clubs. And clubs was given three months by the elected. Association of 69 to go into their own area and find a non-playing executive. So there was a non-playing president, vice president, uh, secretary, treasurer, maybe a manager. And that brought about a great deal of discipline. It brought about um, regular meetings of the clubs, uh, a bit of club life. Uh, I think it, it impacted on discipline. And uh, we also brought in a transfer system, so player A couldn't just owe, you know, fifteen thousand um, dollars to a club and just leave and go and play for another club. He had to get a transfer form. He had to be officially transferred, and the club he was leaving, leaving had to agree that he left in good financial standing and he'd handed over his uniforms and th things like that. So what the association started with three months later was an association made up of clubs, made up of clubs and not teams because strong clubs make a strong association. Thank you. Which brings me to my next question. Uh, what have you learned uh, about basketball in Guyana over the years? Any, any, any particular, what have you learned? Well, basketball basically is uh, a low-income game. Um, tennis and swimming uh, are games that uh, probably uh, comes from the higher, higher so social e economic class. Basketball, boxing, they are a grassroots game. And uh, other than becoming, um, you know, good, good, good basketball players, um, basketball has the potential to save lives. Um, boxing, same thing, you can save football, the same thing. These are grassroots sports that has the potential to change the, the, the life of, of a player. And it has the potential. Um, um, for him to get an overseas contract, possibility of a scholarship, depending on his scholastic abilities. Um, but basketball is a cheap sport. You don't have to invest a great deal. Volleyball, likewise, is also a cheap sport. And I'm su surprised that more volleyball isn't played today because many years ago, all the sugar estates um, owned by then, the Booker Group, played volleyball and they played it on grass, 60 by 30 feet of grass, and every estate had uh, a volleyball team. And I don't think we are following that right now. But, but basketball um, is, once the court is built, basketball is a fairly cheap sport. The equipment isn't all that expensive. And um, it did, in fact, give you a chance to turn into a nursery. When I came in, we had what, 13 schools playing at the secondary school level. If you multiply 13 schools by 10, you'll see straight away you have over 100, and there was a lot more than 100 secondary schools. And what we also did 
when we went to Venezuela to play the CSC games, all the national players made a commitment that they will take a team. Like, for example, Julia Henry went to Christchurch, somebody else went to St. Stanislaus, somebody else went um, to St. George Star, etc., etc. And that's how we built a very strong base. Okay. Hey, thanks. That uh, brings me to my next question. Uh, what is the most important asset um, Ghana basketball has? Let me take it again. In your in your observation, what you believe is the most important asset that Ghana basketball has? Well, I think the, the the greatest asset is the players themselves, is the is the human beings. Um, but uh, you must also see that there are many roles in basketball. Um, you need a strong executive. You need um, people who can administrate, people who can raise money, people who can. Uh, attract sponsorship. Uh, you need a, a different group of people who can go into coaching, go into administration, um, and um, you know, try to focus on development. And Georgetown and basketball can be a Georgetown game. Basketball has got to be a game where um, it's played throughout. I mean. You know, we broke through in those days with the McKenzie um, affiliate. We had something at Mike Coney. Um, New Amsterdam was also a sleeping giant. But I'm sure all those um, areas are much more activated. And I think basketball, instead of being just a Georgetown sport, is now a national sport. Now a national sport. One of the question is, um, you know, can it make money? And a lot will depend on how it programs themselves. Um, how it can have access to the National Sports Hall, which was built for that. What's the cost of using the National Sports Hall? Can they track enough crowds to break even, make a bit of profit? Uh, we just have to wait and see. But each club, um, each affiliate, um, should also try to have fundraising. I know everybody is competing for the same dollar, but if you demonstrate in the private sector that you are trying to raise money, uh, you might in fact encourage them to give you money. But the, the primary school, the secondary school, is the lifeblood of the future. That's the nursery. Okay. Thank you. Uh, which brings me to my fourth question. In your estimation, what is the greatest need for Ghana basketball? The greatest need? If, if you want to maybe plur uh, plurality or, or if you want to treat it singly, what do you think is the greatest need? Well, there, there must be many needs. The many needs is the coaching of coaches, the coaching of coaches, the, the, the um, training of administrators, the training of, of, of referees, and maybe a, a couple of indoor facilities um, or at least one other indoor facility in Georgetown, New Amsterdam, Linden, where you can play indoor. Right now, the National Sports Hall does to serve everything. It serves volleyball, serves hockey, serves boxing, serves basketball, and I can continue. I think if you can get the facilities for basketball improved, um, it doesn't have to be a fancy facility, it can be um, just a facility with a cover, hard coat with a white cover, indoor seating, bleachers, um, it doesn't have to be very fancy. There are models of this around. Uh, you can then create a situation where basketball can be